Second Peter chapter one. I laugh because uh, how many people think that people next to you need a lot of prayer? I need a lot of prayer. And, uh, and so uh, uh, that's uh, how many people think the guy sitting in their seat needs a lot of prayer or the gal. And uh, so uh, we all have this fallen nature and the devil fights us and all those things. And uh, we need prayer. I want to talk today about making a good entrance. Making a good entrance. <clears throat> Second Peter and chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, According uh, as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain to, unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to your knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you uh, that uh, and abound. They make you that you sh ye shall uh, neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, uh, the rather brethren uh, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you in always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am with you in this tabernacle, my body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. So Peter's saying, I'm going to die soon, so I'm trying to get you right before I go. Let's pray. Father, uh, bless this time, we pray, but I pray again you'd speak to us. I need your spirit, so I pray you'd work in a great way and uh, give us your words in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in this passage, we see a lot of things, and I'm not going to elaborate on most of it. I'm going to elaborate on one verse mostly, but I want to give us context and some important thoughts. First of all, he gave us all things for godliness, verse 3. According to his divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Uh, the focus of a faithing Christian is usually how weak they are. The focus of a, of a succeeding Christian is how great God is. Um, yes, you are weak. Um, many Christians say, Pastor, I just, I'm so weak, I can't be a good Christian. And correct, <laughs> yes. Yeah, me too. Well, 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 how do people have victory then? It's not. It's according to his divine power. Okay? Uh, you, you're you wise enough to get access to the proper things. Um, uh, and, 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 and just if I had an, as if I had uh, 10 guys running at me, I'm not strong enough, but give me the right weapon, I am. Okay? I just got to get the right weapon. Okay? Uh, my fist is not the right weapon. But if I'm smart enough, my trigger finger might be. Okay. Uh, in other words, I'm saying there are things stronger than us that we have access to in the spiritual warfare, and it's not uh, in this warfare. It's not a grenade or a, or a gun or anything else. It's God's power. It's God's tools. It's God's weapon. Your wisdom is in knowing that you can't do it and relying on God. Okay. According as says to His divine power, hath given Him all things that pertain to life and godliness. I want you to notice that that all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything in the spiritual life, God has given to us. Let's read that again. According to, as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So we have everything we need. All things. Uh, and so you can be a victorious Christian. God's given you all things you need. Okay? It's there for you. You might not know every tool you have. You might not know all that. But understand, God has given you what you need, no matter where you come from, no matter how weak you are, what you need to become a victorious Christian. It's there for us. They're pertaining to life and godliness uh, through the, the knowledge of him that has called us into his glory and virtue. And uh, so it's through the knowledge of Jesus and, uh, and, uh, and so we get it through the knowledge of God and the knowledge of the Bible. It'd be nice if all of us knew all we needed to know and knew everything we need to get victory in the Christian life. But you know what probably happened? You become a stagnant Christian. You know why I keep coming to church, a lot of you? 
because you keep learning more things about how to become a better Christian. You probably quit coming if, I, if you learned everything, right? Now, some might not. You just come because you love Jesus and because uh, you like the fellowship because I'm so wonderful or whatever. Um, you, might, you might keep coming, but most of us uh, would, a lot of us come because, man, I need, I need to hear from God. I need to get some wisdom. I'm not, I got to figure this thing out. And that's okay. That's great. That's a great reason to come to church. And I'm glad you get something here. Uh, that's a bad thing about church where you don't learn anything. You're just going at a ritual because you're not going to get anything. And, and, and you want to get fed. You want to get, get that. And so we'll learn together and get more and more and, uh, of the thing that God's given us. Because God's given us all that we need. Verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. God's given us great promises that we can rely on through the word of God. That by these... By these, that's the access, the precious promises. What does God promise? I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Uh, we are more than conquerors to him that loved us. Uh, flee also youthful lusts. If you do these things, you shall never fall. A bunch of promises in, in the Bible uh, 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 that you can have. Uh, and the Lord, I'm with you always, even in the world. The promises give you the victory. And through these promises that God's made, it says you become, and this is one of the most amazing phrases of the Bible. This, I'm not saying this for this sermon. I've always thought that one of the most amazing phrases in the Bible is, is there in verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, the promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. That phrase, you become partakers of the divine nature, is amazing. God's very nature, you become a partaker of that. Why? God lives inside of you. You get the word of God dwelling in you. All the things of God are, are in you, and you become a partaker of God's great power. Why? Because God has given you uh, His Holy Spirit. God's given you His nature. God's given you His His, uh, His DNA, it talks about in 1 John. God's seed is in us. And so we actually get, that's why the Bible says, Abide me, and I and you, I'm the vine, you're the branches. When we're plugged into the vine, the life of God flows into us and become fruitful because we are being a partaker of the divine nature. God's life is flowing into us. And so we, we become partakers of what God gives us. We get a little bit of God's goodness and God's power. You, you're not a God, but you get the things of God into you. And that tra transforms you and makes you different. And uh, thank God for that, because our natures aren't so hot. And, uh, and God's natures uh, changes us. And uh, in verse 4, continue, it says, uh, partakes of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And you got to escape that. Don't think you can be a victorious Christian and continue to have the world's corruption in you. This world is a corrupting world. If you are worldly, if the world likes you, if you like the world, if you're watching the things of the world and listen to the music of the world and, and, and listen to the priorities of the world and, and let the world talk to you and, and let it decide what you wear and how, what you listen to and when you go to church and what's acceptable to our society, you're going to be corrupted because the Bible says you've got to escape the corruption that is in this world. You've got to escape that. And we're supposed to do that. Then this chapter goes in and teaches us to diligently add and grow. Verse 5. It says, beside this, uh, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to your virtue knowledge. And continues on. I'll, I'll get that in a second. I just want to say it says with all diligence. I want to ask you in your life, you're probably really diligent about something. I don't know what it is. Everybody's different. Um, uh, you might be really diligent about working out. Uh, you might be really diligent about uh, uh, watching your favorite show. You might be really diligent about, about taking care of your kids. You might be really diligent when you're at work. You might be really diligent about your hobby. You might be really diligent about a lot of different things. As diligent as you are about anything. It's amazing the guy who can't get up for work when his hunting season is up at 3 in the morning. When it's time to go bowling or time to go to, uh, to watch a football game, this guy, I mean, the organization he goes to to prepare to watch a game, yes, they were, had to wear the right shirt, had the right dip for the right chips, uh, sit in the right chair. Do, uh, and he's so diligent. And nothing's going to interrupt him from watching that football game. Right? Diligence. And the Bible says this. It says that, Using all of your diligence, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge. It's talking about growing and adding things to your spiritual life. Are you diligent in the spiritual life? As you are when you're on a basketball court. Or when you're uh, 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 ready to go and uh, go shopping. 
and you're diligently prepared to go shopping, you got your list, or you've got your, you know, your credit card or whatever. It says, add to your faith virtue. I want you to be diligent to grow. And look, it's adding. I'm still adding. I'm not there yet. Look, add to your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge and temperance, all these things. It goes forward through it forward to the list. And I'd love to go through, but it's it's way too much information to to in this sermon because it's not the primary thing we're teaching. But I'll just give you the list. Add to your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, to temperance, uh, patience, and to patience, godliness. So you're supposed to add all those things. I just want to uh, uh, note one thing is just uh, uh, add to your faith. And of course, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Virtue. That's the thing we're missing. Yes, we're missing faith, and we all know that. But virtue. Virtue is is his it's fascinating in the Bible because there's a few different words, but 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 the, the word virtue is manly strength. What does that mean? It means you got to be tough, and I'm going to do this anyway. I'm going to find a way to do it. That is such a missing thing in our society. There's no virtue among people anymore. Well, it's tough. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's amazing. You need your Bible every day. Well. That's hard. Yes. Somehow we've got to this, this, the level of weakness in America nowadays where it's tough is now an ending point. <laughs> and then, now, okay, that's the end of the conversation. It's tough. You don't expect me to do something tough, do you? Look, if you want to do anything great in life, you're going to have to do tough things. You have to do things hard. You have to go to work and you don't feel like it. You're going to have to get up early. You're going to have to uh, uh, be nice if you don't feel like it. You have to do a whole bunch of things that are tough. It's just tough. You've got to be tough. you got to have some strength that says, you know what? This is tough, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know, I'm getting up. I'm going to find a way to get this done. That's virtue. The, the buckling we do nowadays. And I say we, uh, 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 not me. I'm not going to buckle on this stuff like, like people do. Uh, and you know what? I tried to be right and it came, it came so hard. Yeah, I've been doing that for 30 years. Yeah, it's hard. You think being a, you're warring against a soup, bunch of supernatural creatures. What do you think is going to be easy? I went to fight uh, ISIS and, and they were mean and shot back. Well, what'd you expect, dummy? You're fighting against evil things and they hate you. They Look. I went to play football, and, and I had the ball, and they tackled me. I'm stopping. What do you expect to happen? Whatever happened to good old-fashioned toughness? Our boys are girls nowadays, and I don't even know what our girls are. Get some virtue. Get some strength that says, you know what? God told me to do this. I'll find a way. It's going to be tough, but I'm going to find a way. I'm going to be strong. And it's, it's, it's an important characteristic. God is strong. Jesus sweat uh, uh, drops of blood and still went out and went to the cross. It's not easy to be a good Christian. Not easy to come back to church at night. It won't be easy for me to preach at night. I'll be tired when I... Uh, look, I'll be tired the whole time in the Philippines. I won't have time to get on the right schedule. What are you going to do when you, when, you, when you get up and tired and you go to preach? I'll preach. That's what I'll do. And I'll preach three times. And what do you do? I don't know. You tough it out. Life's not easy. Don't be a wimp. You can't be a good Christian and a, good, and, and a wimp. And, and younger generation, everything in the society is saying, if it's tough, just stop. Just find a little safe zone and, 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 and curl up. Look, you can't do that in life. No safe zones in life. You got to be strong. You got to say, I don't feel like doing this. I am dying inside, but I'm going to do this anyway. All right, it's not the, not the sermon, but you got to get that virtue thing. You better add that thing. If you're a wimp, you won't be a good Christian. Next, uh, and to knowledge, temperance, and to control, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Okay, so we're supposed to add these things diligently. And I just want to ask a question, are you growing? Are you adding? These virtues make you so you are fruitful and steady. Verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. And so you want to become a stable Christian, you add, 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 add. 
add these things to you. And once you get these balance, these all these things make you a complete Christian. It makes you so you're fruitful in the Christian life, and you're and you have virtue, and uh, you have all those things. And so, and so uh, you you stay stable as a Christian, and it helps you, and doing that. And then I want to uh, uh, really um, uh, uh, hit on the next two verses. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, uh, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. That's your salvation. I got a bunch of verses on this that, that shows that. It's talking about salvation. I'm not going to go into them. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Add those things and grow, then make sure you're saved. You will not fall as a Christian. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly uh, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. First thing I want to say, make sure you are saved. Make your calling and election sure. The Bible says it in a different way. Uh, 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 make your calling and election sure. It says also, it says, uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. These things are all saying the same thing. It says, make sure you are going to heaven. See, biblically, it is not your trembling, hoping I get there. That is not biblical. Well, I hope when I get there, God said I did enough. You don't understand salvation at all. Okay, Jesus paid it all. Jesus said, it is finished. It says you already know you're, you're forgiven if you did it right. It says if you, uh, 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 verse 9, he says, uh, For he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Notice that. Purge is already done. Past tense. So when you're saved, you already know your sins are gone. He that hath the Son hath life, present tense. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The Bible says this, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath, and the word King, in the King James word hath is present tense, it means has. Has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Salvation is supposed to be something that you're sure of. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. You know it. That's what God's will is. Now, I've been listening to it for 30 years, 32 years, constantly. I will listen to it this week. I will listen to it next week. I listen every week. The person who comes up with their emotional arguments. Well, how can you know you're saved? What if you're going to mess up? You can't really know that thing. What if you kill 10 people the day you die? Da -da 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 okay. My salvation is not based on me. I am not my Savior. My salvation is Jesus Christ, who died for my sins. I believe on the name of the Son of God. I know I have eternal life. I understand salvation produces some things. It's produced those things in my life. I know I'm saved because of what God did in my life, because how He worked in my life, how He transformed me. Okay? That's an evidence. Okay? If you came up and felt my, felt my pulse right now, you would find out I'm alive. That, look, my heart is beating and my lungs are going, despite what some of you want, because I'm alive. You're going to feel my pulse and find out, yes, he is alive. I could be laying on the ground and not doing anything. You feel my pulse, you know I'm alive. Why? The evidence of it. Works are an evidence of your salvation. If your works are producing your salvation, you're the Savior, you're trusting you as Savior, and you, you, don't, you don't got it. I'm trusting Christ. I know when I started, I was a sinner. I deserve hell. I don't deserve heaven. I knew that. That's why I had to trust Christ. Once I trusted Christ, my Savior, he came into me. His Holy Spirit came in and started changing me. And evidence of my salvation came out of my works because God worked and showed he's inside of me and changed me. But if I'm saying I've got to be good to go to, go to heaven, I'm trusting me. I'm trusting Christ. He, the, the works are the evidence of salvation. Stop the old, uh, I don't know if I'm going to go because I'm just such a bad person. You're, that's why you need a Savior. Okay? That's why. And so I'm completely trusting Christ, not me. If my salvation is dependent upon me, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to mess it up. Look, I know I need my keys and I lose them. I lose my salvation every day if it was up to me. I'm trusting Christ, not me. If you're trusting you, I feel sorry for you because you have no assurance of your salvation. You can't get, how do you know that I have no assurance? Because everybody who trusts themselves doesn't have assurance of their salvation. 
That's what all of them say. Well, you can't really know because what if you mess up? I'm, I'm still not there yet. You're not there yet. You're trusting you and you don't have any assurance. But the Bible says make your calling and election sure. You're saying you've gotten to the point where you don't sin anymore? Because the wages of sin, singular, is death. If you're trusting you and you sin once, you're going to be shaken. I'm so glad my salvation, because I decided to put it in Christ, is secure. Look, if, if, I, if I'm the worst driver in the world, and I crash every time I drive, and I'm legally blind, and I have 26 DUIs, and I'm drunk. If I get in the car and you're driving, it doesn't matter how bad a driver I am. I'm trusting you. When I trusted Christ my Savior, I took my salvation out of my hands because I'm a sinner. And said, Christ, you're my Savior. I need you to save me. And Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Make your calling and election sure. If you never trusted Jesus Christ, your Savior, trust him. Make sure you're saved. It's important to the next part, and the main thing I want to talk about is you want to do that because you want to make a good entrance. Oh, let's go to verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you've added your faith virtue and all these things, if you are remembering your salvation and making sure you're saved, it says, so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. Boy, entrances are a big deal. You know that? You'd be surprised how, how you enter into something or how you enter into a room affects things. Look, if I walk in the room, if I, if I came into your house and I walked in like this. <laughs> Just my entrance affects everything. What if I walk into your room and I got a gigantic cake? That's a good entrance, right? Yes, that's a good entrance. What if I walk in there and I got a giant cake and I trip and fall and smash my face right into the cake? That's a bad entrance. Okay? The Bible says you want an abundant entrance into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you go into heaven, you want to go in with a happy entrance. That's the sermon today. Make a good entrance. Verse, uh, verse uh, 10, wherefore, uh, verse 11, it, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I would not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established. I want to get you right. I want you to be strong. I want you to add to your faith virtue. I want you to make your calling election sure so you can walk into heaven and have a wonderful entrance into heaven and go in there right and go in there. Look, I want to say when you die, let me just really briefly just tell you what happens when you die. When you die, if you're born again, you do not go in and you are not judged whether you're going to get in or not. Okay? If you're judged according to your works, it's in Revelation 20, it's called a great white throne judgment. The Bible says the books are open, the books of our work, works. And if you're judged by your works where they're going in, everybody at the, at the Revelation 20 judgment goes to hell because they're judged according to their works. Okay? If you're judged whether you go into heaven according to your works, you're lost because there's none righteous, no, not one. Right? So that's Revelation 20. That is a totally different judgment. The Bible says we up here before a judgment. It's not the great white throne judgment where God the Father is sitting there. It is the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, now a couple of verses on this. Uh, we'll take it to 2 Corinthians uh, 5, and then I'll also quote to you Romans, our memory verse, uh, Romans 14, 12. 2 Corinthians, <clears throat> Romans 14 says, for every one of us may, must give an account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. And verse 9 says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, it's not going to say that we'll get to heaven or hell. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done whether it be good or bad. Okay? Notice that at this judgment seat, it says you get rewarded according to what you've done. It's a reward judgment. And 
it can be good or bad. It is not a judgment of where you're going. It's a judgment of what you're getting. And to some people, this judgment's very rewarding and very good. And to some, it's very bad. It's your job. If some people were paid according to what they did, they would not be paid well. And if people were, and some people would be paid very well. God is on a pure scale of you earn what you get in heaven, your rewards. Okay, and 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 it's it's not. It's not, uh, it's not, a, it's an individual thing. Everyone will give an account of himself to God. That being true, just a few things. One, first of all, you don't need to worry so much about other people. Make sure you're right. We get our eyes so much, like, what's he doing? Why is he doing that? Why is she doing that? And you get so caught up in other people, you don't do what you're supposed to do. Take care of yourself. Make sure you're doing what you're supposed to do first. Because you're going to give an account of yourself. Okay. Once you're doing really, really good, then, okay, start helping other people. But make sure you're ready to give an account. It says whether good or bad. Jesus said in another spot, he says, you'll give an account of every idle word. Every idle word. Whoa! So this judgment seat happens. What happens? The Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. If I, if I died right now, if, uh, if something tragic happened, I died right now, I would immediately be in front of a throne, Jesus would be sitting. It's called a bema seat in the Greek. Uh, I would be in front of that throne. I would be in front of, and Jesus would be on that throne, and he would begin to make me give an account. I gave you this. What did you do with it? I gave you this. What did you do with it? Why did you do this? Now, Jesus died for all my sins. Jesus uh, uh, knows all I do. Jesus knows the whole situation. We don't know every little detail about this. I believe because Jesus... Uh, was the man God. He came down and lived in the flesh and, and dwelt among us and was all points tempted like we are. I think Jesus knows our failures. I think God the Father doesn't or he wouldn't go into heaven. Okay, that's my opinion. I can't prove that. I think that fits in with all the, the things here. I think Jesus says, why didn't you do this? Why did you, why did you waste your time on this? According to what he had done, this thing is judged. I want you to understand this. This thing's judged according to what God gave you. Okay, that's very important, this thing. You and I are not judged against each other. Okay, if you're a person with bad health, you are not judged like me with good health. If you're a person who, who is deaf, you would not be judged as someone who's, who, could, who, who, who could speak to everybody, witness to everybody. You are judged according to your situation. If you got saved at 60, you're not judged the same way as somebody who grew up in a Christian home. You're accountable for what opportunities you have. Okay, let's go to Matthew 25, and I'll, 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 I'll go into that a little bit. But you're going to be judged according to your opportunities. By the way, just so you know, because you are in a church like this, and you hear what you hear preached, you're more accountable. Okay, because you've heard how to preach the gospel. You've heard holiness. You've heard separation. You've heard about the power of God. You've heard a lot of Bible. You, 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 you're more accountable. God gives you things. So, so what God does, God just walks up, and in life, God gives you, and he gives one person one dollar worth of talent, and, uh, and he gives that person ten dollars worth of talent. And so, and, uh, and, uh, and so, he does that, and now if I give him ten, I expect him to give me a lot more. Okay? So don't worry about, well, I'm not as good as other people. You're not against other people. You are judged according to what you have been given. Okay? So you have the opportunity to earn as much rewards as the Apostle Paul. You have the opportunity to earn as much rewards as me, and I have as much opportunity as you do. Because God is fair. He's what I give you, I, I, I give that. And, and I'll, I'll show you that <clears throat> in the parable of the talents. Matthew 25 is... is is fascinating, and I want to just uh, just show you some things. And uh, let's see. Um, let's go to verse uh, 14. And the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man traveling to a far country, and called his servants, and delivered to them his goods. And he gave to one five talents, the other two talents, and another one talent. And every man, according to his several ability, and straightway he took his journey. We're going to find out when he goes back, he gave he expected a return. 
He, a quarter, he gave them a quarter of their bill and he expected to return accordingly. He expected the one who had five talents to return five talents. He expected the one with one talent to return two talents. Five talents have ten talents, two talents, uh, one talent, two talents. He expected to double. So the person who had more talents to start with, he expects more out of. If you're a person who, who has a lot of charisma and a lot of ability and you are sharp and you're capable and God has given you a good family and good health, look, you, you're a lot of expected of you of God. Okay, uh, I don't work a secular job anymore. God expects more of me than a pastor who works a secular job. Okay, it's just the way life is. Whatever you, uh, wherever you're put, whatever God's given you, He, he judges you according to that. According to that. Now, when you enter, I want to give you a few points, and it won't be long. Number one, seek the praise of the faithful. Verse twenty-one. It says, "The Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things." I will make the ruler over many enter into the joy of thy Lord. Second one doubled his. Now I want to say that the one who had five talents, he said the same thing. He, he says in verse 21, well done, thy good and faithful servant. The one who had two talents doubled his. And it says in verse 23, the Lord said unto him, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Exact same praise for the one who had more talents, but the, as for the one who had less talents, but they both doubled their their what they were given, okay? Because it's according to what you've been given. He says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful. The two, the word he uses twice is faithful. Faithful. God will look down to this and says, have you been faithful with what I've given you? Have you been faithful to do to stick with it? Have you stayed faithful to me unto death? Have you stayed faithful to me and done the things you should do when it's hard? Have you been faithful with the truth I've given you and given it to other people? Have you been faithful to go to church every Sunday? Have you been faithful to read your Bible? Have you done the things you should do? I love the word faithful. Faithful does not require talent. The greatest ability is dependability. And, 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 and when God just says, you've been faithful that I've given you, you've taken good care of it. And you've used it wisely. And you are have been faithful. When you go to heaven, you want Jesus sitting in that throne to look at you and says, well done, that good and faithful servant. Don't you want to hear that? You can hear that when you get to heaven. Seek to have the well done. Seek to have the praise of the faithful given to you. Number two, avoid the slothful entrance. Matthew 25 and verse 26, his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathers where I have not strawed. God's demanding. He says, you just took that one town I gave you and you hid it in the ground and you brought me nothing back but what I gave you. And if you go into heaven and all you bring back to God is what he gave you, which is a body and a brain. He says, look, I wanted some souls. I wanted some investment. I wanted some prayer. I wanted some giving. I wanted some sacrifice. I wanted you to impact people. I wanted you did nothing. You were lazy. I don't want to die and, and sit in front of Jesus and him look down at me and says, you wicked and slothful servant. And I look up there and see nailed, scarred hands and nailed, scarred feet and a spear in his side. And he calls me. You wicked and slothful servant. Maybe I maybe I push too hard when I uh, on myself and and what I do and do do too much and maybe I do. But you know what? I'm not going to get to heaven and have God say you wicked and slothful servant, and then live with that because I can't go back and fix it. Then time's done. I'd rather sleep a little bit too little than a little bit too much. I'm not saying sleep two hours a night. But you know what? I don't want to get to heaven and God say, you did nothing. Now I'm saved because of him. But the rewarding time, it says, according to what he had done, whether it be good or bad. I want to help people. I want to make a difference. I want to, I want to do something for God. I want God to say, good job. The Bible says these people who are wicked and slothful serve it. It does not say they don't go to heaven. 1 Corinthians 3 says this, <clears throat> and man, am I late. 
You guys have delayed me so much during this sermon, making me preach on things that I wasn't going to preach on. In 1 Corinthians 3, uh, it talks about what happens to those people who are not good Christians. It says everything they have gets burnt up. Everything they built gets burnt up. It's tried by fire. In verse 13, it says, 1 Corinthians 3, 13, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work for what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss, no reward. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as though by fire. When that Bible says you're still saved, so is by fire. It means we would say in the English by the skin of your teeth. Yes, you're getting in heaven, but barely. Because you're saved by Christ. God's going to say, you're coming in because of these right here. But you have earned nothing. You're very lucky I'm letting you in. Shame on you. No reward. Okay, come in. Nah, look at that one. Well done, now. I don't want that to happen to me. Avoid the slothful entrance. Yeah, you can make excuses. But God brings everything out clear. It says everything to judge righteously. And the truth will come out. And you'll say, but I did. Yes, you did. No, stop it. But I couldn't. Yes, you could have. Stop it. We're an excuse society, by the way excuses. People would tell me, I can't come to church tonight, Pastor. I said, if we give $1,000 out to everybody who came to church tonight, could you come? Whoa, well, yeah. Okay, so church is not as high a priority to you, but you could come. Well, but you know, the, the Seahawks are playing tonight. It's a big game. Okay. You will stand in front of God one day and say, do you say, why do you go to, why do you watch a football game instead of go to church? Everything will melt away. Well, that went good, over good. All right. Next, avoid the storehouse waste. Luke chapter 12. Good night, it's late. Luke 12. Luke 12. Avoid the storehouse ha- house waste. Basically, the story, this man goes out and, and has a great harvest, and he builds bigger and bigger, bigger buildings. And stores all his stuff in there. And Luke uh, 12, 19, it says, And I will say unto my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Uh, then who shall these thing, those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The storehouse waits as you get to heaven who had a whole bunch left on earth when you died. And you did not give it to God. That is the storehouse waste. It's you had a whole bunch you could have done for God you didn't do. You had a whole bunch you could have given you didn't give. And that's the storehouse waste. Don't die and say, Lord, if I'd have known the treasures in heaven, I would have got for these things. I would have got rid of those things. Don't do that. Your life is short. Don't waste your time. Don't think I have time. I'm going to become a good Christian someday. I'm going to start witnessing someday. I'm going to start helping people someday. I'm going to start praying someday. Don't do this stuff. You're wait, you're going to, you don't know when your soul's required of you. None of us know. Look, there was people in church in, in Texas a month ago who were all just in church and didn't know a bunch of them were going to die. Just like us. Just in church. You don't know. So do not sit here and waste your time and waste the things you've been given. Next, seek the overcomer's reward. Revelation chapter 2. When you go into heaven, make a good entrance. Don't fall on your face and put your face in the cake. Don't do that when you walk into heaven. Don't make a bad entrance. Walk into the good entrance. Walk in. People say, wow, look at this guy. Man, he's bringing some treasures with him. Angels, go get some wagons. This, (laughs) This guy. Man, how many, you live like 500 years? How'd you get so many treasures? That's, that's the way I want to go in. Revelation 2, get the overcomer's reward. There are a bunch of rewards that are only for overcomers. 
It, Jesus talks to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, and then he says, And every time, let him that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then he says, Him that overcometh, I will give these things. So individuals who overcome get special rewards in heaven that you get to live with for eternity, but it's only for overcomers. It is not for your typical Christians, for people who overcome things. Verse 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. In, in heaven, there's a tree of life. You can eat that if you're an overcomer. Say, Pastor, explain that to me. I don't have time. And I don't know if I understand all of it. Some of these things are pretty crazy. But overcomers get those things. And I want to earn those things. Because not everybody gets them. Verse 11, he, uh, he that hath near that him here with the Spirit saith unto the churches, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. They're not going to be saved like as though by fire. They're not going to be burned at all. Verse 12, uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. There's some hidden food in heaven that only overcomers get to eat. And by the way, when it comes, if there's something good to eat, I want to earn it. And uh, I want that. And it's hidden manna. You know, though, we people, if I understand this verse, and I'm just, there are people walking around heaven say, where is that manna? Never been able to eat it. Now, I, I bet the food's good in heaven, but the hidden manna is only for overcomers. I'm going to smile. I have it stuck in my teeth, buddy. I won't be that way in heaven, will I? And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and you know what? He gives those overcomers the chance to eat of the hidden man. I bet the hidden man is pretty good. Probably biscuits and gravy or something like that and, 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 and things like that. <clears throat> Well, I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in that white stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, that name, save in he that receiveth it. You and Jesus have a special name. Jesus will write your name on a white stone, and it's a special name that only you and Jesus will know. And it's a special thing. Now, we don't understand how cool that'll be, but I bet you if God includes that, it's pretty cool. But a lot of people won't have that white stone. They're not overcomers. Uh, let's see, verse 26. And him that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end will I give power over the nations. During the millennium you rule with him. He that, he, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and as vessels of potter shall they break, uh, uh, so be broken into shivers, uh, as I received my father. There's other passages on this, uh, on the ruling thing, but the but Bible says some people gives ten cities, some people gives one. According to how you live in life during the thousand year reign of Christ, you get to rule with Christ over more authority or in more regions, or in more areas. And you get to do that. And I will give him the morning star. What's the morning star, Pastor? Well, Jesus is called the morning star. Whatever it is, I want a morning star. He did not near, let him hear what the Spirit saith in the churches. Chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 4. It says, thou, uh, thou hast a few names even left in Sardis, which not defile their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy, him that overcometh. The saints should be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name of the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. By the way, just so you know, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. Jesus introduces certain Christians as father. This is Daniel Wong. He served me faithfully all these years, father. He served us all those years faithfully. Daniel Wong has been faithful. And certain Christians, he says, go in. You don't get introduced to Father. Some people get white garments, some don't. I think we walk around heaven, and you're one of the ones who aren't in white. That's your righteousness by the way you live on earth. Him that overcometh gets these treasures. You say, but my life's so hard. I have this thing, and this thing's against me. You are so lucky you got things to overcome. What opportunities you have to earn treasures. You're very fortunate. You mean you don't got it easy? Those people who got it all easy like you wanted, they have nothing to overcome and no way to earn these treasures. It's really good that you have something to overcome. Speaking the English, it's really good you have something to overcome. It's really good you have something to overcome. Quit whining about it. 
say, thank you, Lord, for that challenge. Lord, it's so hard, but Lord, we're going to overcome it. I'm earning some treasures for this one, Lord. Keep track. Help me. Watch the next one. This one's crazy. Let's see, verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. In heaven, there's a temple just like in Jerusalem. Uh, everything's copied. Is a, everything on earth is a copy of a heaven. Him that overcometh will I make a temple, a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. In the temple in heaven, the overcomers are pillars in that temple, and they don't have to leave it. Non-overcomers, they go in and say, wow, this is amazing. Okay, time to go out. That's where God is, by the way. And I'll write upon him the name of my God. And the name of uh, uh, the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, that cometh down from heaven, I will write upon him my new name. And it says there, it says, look, him that overcometh is going to get a bunch of special names. And I'm going to write on you. You get, this is the only biblical tattoo. And uh, he says, I'm going to write on you the name of New Jerusalem. I'm going to write on you the name of me. And you get that written on you. You're marked as a mighty Christian. You get to wear that forever. Verse 21 is the most amazing one to me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down in my father with my father on his throne. Those that overcome get to go up on a Jesus throne. Jesus, have a seat. And those who don't get to say, oh, I wish I would have. I wish I could sit there. But for trillions of years, you won't get to. Never. Because while you had this blip of life, you didn't overcome. Seek to make an entrance. So when you go in, God says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. And you get great reward in heaven. And you get persecuted. Boy, we rejoice. You get more, more treasure. You get all those things. But above all these things, make sure you're going to be there. Because everybody in heaven's happy. Everybody in heaven's happy. But there are some people who get a lot more. Make a good entrance into heaven.